Okay, uh, good, af good evening everybody. We will get started. It is uh, 6.08, so we will call to order this uh, special meeting of council. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. At this time, I would like to confirm that in, in addition to yourself, we have the following members of council present, Councillor Chappelle, Councillor Hill, Councillor Hutchison, Councillor Kiley, Councillor McLaren, and Councillor Osanek. Present from staff are Lanny Hurdle, Chief Administrative Officer, Paige Agnew, Commissioner of Community Services, Peter Hugenboss, Commissioner of Business Environment and Projects, Desiree Kennedy, Chief Financial Officer and City Treasurer, John Bolognone, City Clerk, Jenna Morley, Director of Legal Services and City Solicitor, Tim Park, Director of Planning Services, Sukriti Agarwal, Manager of Policy Planning, James Barr, Manager of Development Approvals, <clears throat> excuse me, Andrea Gummel, Manager Heritage Planning, Janet James, Deputy City Clerk, Derek O'Shea, Committee Clerk. Our tech support tonight is Chris Sabrin and Colin Taylor. Uh, we also have the following staff from uh, the Planning Department, Laura Flaherty, Manager of Policy Planning, Niall Audi, Senior Planner, Mike Silagi, Planner, Brent, and joining us is Brent Totter and from Totter and Urban Works. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we will move to the approval of the adds. We have four sets of adds, uh, all uh, with communication related to uh, our agenda tonight. Can I have a mover and a seconder for those adds, please? Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Kiley. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, then we will um, we'll move through our agenda. Obviously, as a special council meeting, there's a number of agenda items that will not apply. So we will move uh, right to reports. For first up, we have, oh, are we gonna do, we'll do the briefing with the report. So that's fine. So why don't we put the, the um, we'll move to report 42 and then we'll introduce the briefing. Moved by Councillor Kyle and seconded by Councillor Hill that report 42 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted. Okay, so just before we uh, look at the agenda item in front of us, we'll, uh, we'll move to a staff briefing. I believe uh, Commissioner Agnew uh, will uh, take things from here. Thank you and, and good evening everyone. Mayor Patterson and councillors, and certainly all of you in the community that may be tuning in tonight uh, via YouTube. It's really my pleasure to be here. We've been on a long road to get to where we are tonight, uh, seven years. And uh, that's a long time in the life of, uh, it's actually two city councils, not just one. So we're, we're really happy to be here this evening and, and certainly happy to present to you what is staff's final version of Kingston's new zoning bylaw. But before we get into the technical detail, I wanted to just make a couple of comments and, and especially comments of thanks and, and gratitude because this has been a long process and I think there's a lot of recognition that needs to happen before we get into the details tonight. Uh, firstly, a heartfelt thank you to the community for all of your patience and tremendous contributions to the final draft that's before council this evening. I think from a staff perspective, and we've said it before, we truly believe that the quality of the final version of what we're presenting to you this evening is certainly a reflection of the thoughtful and challenging feedback that we received along the way. And, and there's been hundreds of submissions, thousands of hours uh, of work that's gone into this evening and, and a lot of contributions from the community, which takes a lot of time and dedication because oftentimes the packages of information are quite dense in detail and long in nature. And, and there's been multiple throughout the process of the life of this project. So thank you so much to the community as a whole. Secondly, I really wanted to extend also a sincere gratitude, sense of gratitude to all of city council. Um, most importantly for the advice that we've received from you along the way, um, certainly your willingness to give us more time to make the final version what it is uh, today, I believe. And then most importantly, I think the, the inspiration and the aspiration of your, your leadership and your confidence and, and bold decision-making around climate change and smart growth certainly were, were beacons that led us through the final version of what we've presented to you this evening and I think are a real step forward for Kingston. So thank you for your leadership. And finally, and certainly not, not least of all, a real expression of sincere gratitude 
to our current generation of planning professionals whose unwavering dedication to professional excellence has led to the work that's before you this evening. In particular, I'd like to highlight the leadership of Laura Flaherty, who will be talking to you tonight in terms of some of the details as the project manager and Sakruti Agarwal, who is our manager of policy planning and helped to lead the central Kingston growth strategy, which has been folded into the final version of Kingston's new bylaw. Um, also, you know, as we worked a lot on the policy planning, which has taken literally hundreds of hours, we have a whole department that has also at the same time received the highest number of development approval applications that the city seen on record. And without the dedication and support of James Barr and Tim Park, uh, we wouldn't be able to have kept the department operating while we were doing this fundamental policy work. So thank you to them as well. Jordan Rogers is a new manager in our group and he's in charge of the GIS group. And as part of the delivery of the zoning bylaw tonight, what we've been able to create internally is a new innovative mapping application that really helps to provide the community with a whole new resource with respect to uh, the zoning bylaw. And thank you to Jordan and his whole team because uh, they really delivered some innovative solutions and did it in a very timely manner, especially in time for the third draft that we're presenting to you this evening. I think that this, uh, this project overall is really demonstrated excellence in teamwork and collaboration. Um, especially with a number of other departments. This isn't just a delivery of planning services, but uh, in addition to GIS, which I've talked about, the Heritage Services Group formed an important part of this conversation and the overlay information that's part of the new zoning bylaw. Transportation Services, certainly the Conservation Authority has been there with us the whole time and advising us on changes. Uh, the real estate team and certainly our city solicitor, Jenna Morley, has, has been a strong uh, advocate for us at the table, but also technical person along the way, ensuring that legally we are abiding by everything that we needed to. We have Mr. Brent Totterin with us this evening, who the council is aware of. Um, he's joining us in his capacity as a technical advisor for our planning team. He's been working with us a number of years, and he's been a really important sounding board, particularly in the last 18 months as we've been finishing the final phase of the zoning bylaw project. And he really challenges our ideas all the time and has greatly assisted, I think, to elevate the bylaw to where it is now and also was a, a key contributor in helping uh, some of the work in the power of parking in particular to receive national attention through a publication in Municipal World Magazine. And he was a strong contributor to that. And, and that was a strong highlight and, and, and shone a spotlight on the city of Kingston in a really positive way. So thank you to Brent for joining us this evening and, and your support along the way. So without further ado, uh, Planning Services is proud to present Kingston's new zoning bylaw, which we'd like to consider a made in Kingston solution authored by Kingston city builders. So without further ado, Laura Flaherty is going to present to you the contents of draft three, and we'll be here with you for the rest of this evening to take any questions that you may have. Over to you, Laura, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paige. And um, so <laughs> I think the, the first uh, three slides are actually intended to go along with Paige's uh, presentation there. So if you could just skip to, I guess, slide number four where I can begin. Sorry. Oh, can you just go back one slide? Sorry about that. Okay, so thank you, Paige. Good evening, your worship and members of council. So obviously my name is Laura Flaherty. I'm a project manager in planning services. And as you know, my responsibility right now is the city's new zoning bylaw project. So first and foremost, before I get into the details of the new zoning bylaw project, on tonight's agenda, there's obviously a supplementary report with new, recommend new recommendations from staff that are intended to replace the previous recommendations that were on the planning committee agenda. So this report includes all of the responses to the questions that were raised at the planning committee, uh, meeting on April 7th. It also includes an updated recommendation which removes the right crescent intensification area from our work at this time, which means that it would be considered through a separate process and a separate report in the future. Um, so Sukriti Agarwal, the manager of policy planning, will speak to the CKGS and the right crescent component of this later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So the work presented here tonight through both the supplementary report and the comprehensive report integrates the recommendations of two really important uh, 
projects for the city. So the Central Kingston Growth Strategy, which you'll hear us call the CKGS and the New Zoning Bylaw Project. So on the screen in front of you, I have a very simple diagram showing the five main recommendations and how the work of these two projects has led into these five main recommendations. So the CKGS has contributed both um, components of the official plan amendment and specific sections of the new zoning bylaw. And then the new zoning bylaw project itself has proposed amendments uh, through a proposed OPA bylaw, the actual Kingston zoning bylaw itself. Um, it also includes a proposed brand new cash in lieu of parking bylaw and an amendment to the fees and charges bylaw related to that cash in lieu of parking bylaw, and also some proposed amendments to the delegated authority bylaw. So I'll speak to those recommendations later in this presentation, but I really just wanted to give you an understanding of how the two projects have been combined into one set of recommendations to these reports. Next slide, please. So in the interest of time tonight, we're not going to get into a great amount of detail about the background of this project since you've all heard this conversation many times before. And obviously the size of the agenda package you've all received, there's clearly a lot of detailed information that we can possibly cover in a short presentation this evening. So um, we're going to try to focus the presentation on some of the bigger, more strategic policy moves. And obviously we do have a number of staff here that are happy to answer any of your detailed questions following the presentation. So the zoning bylaw itself, the final version in includes um, a five-part text document as well as a series of maps that correspond with the text. Um, in the open house presentation from March 30th, we did a pretty deep dive into um, the breakdown of each section by section and all of the, the various information that's available on the, all of the schedules. And we also kind of did a primer on how to use the interactive mapping tool. So if you want a little bit more detailed information, I do recommend going back and checking out that pre presentation. Next slide, please. So as you all know, we currently have five main zoning bylaws. In some instances, they're upwards of 45 years old. They don't protect resources. They restrict certain types of housing and employment opportunities. And they also don't prior prioritize appropriate forms of transportation. So the main purpose of the new zoning bylaw is to implement the official plan policies and to really connect the vision for future growth in the OP with our zoning bylaw. So we're required to do it by the Planning Act and it hasn't been done. So it's really time for the new zoning bylaw to really implement those OP policies on the ground. Um, the final draft includes some standards that really are still reflective of the original project scope, which had focused on a consolidation of the existing zoning bylaws. But there was a turning point about 18 months ago where you know, instead of just consolidating the existing provisions, there really became this sense of urgency and a different ambition that shifted this project more towards a tweak and a rethink of a number of different provisions and fundamental components. So um, the proposed zoning bylaw that's attached to the report represents a really good mix of all three, the consolidation, tweak, and rethink. And it, it certainly has given us the ability to really embrace um, a lot of the council's strategic plan and priorities and the broader OP policies. Next slide, please. So obviously this project dates way back to 2016. The first draft was released, or the, the first draft was created by an outside consultant and released to the public in October of 2016. And we did extensive public consultation and outreach at that point in time. We attended a number of events all across the city and held a whole slew of uh, coffee chats and, and uh, pop-in conversations with staff. So, um, the project was put on hold in 2017 when we were completing the OP update and the newly directed CKGS work began. Um, so really fast forward to September of 2020, so actually less than 18 months ago. And as staff, we really took hold of the zoning bylaw itself. Um, the only outside consultant who's participated in it has been Brent Totteron and specifically on the power of parking discussion paper. But all of the mapping and all of the work that's been done on the text of the bylaw itself has been done in-house by city staff. So we've got, undergone extensive public consultation over the course of the last 18 months. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen in front of you, you'll see a number of public events and stakeholder opportunities. Um, they all happened during COVID, so the, uh, the majority of them have been virtual. All of the events that are bolded have been um, archived and are public publicly available um, for anyone who's interested in watching those. So obviously what's not on this slide are the thousands of emails, phone conversations, individual meetings with pop property owners and interested 
people who have participated through the process. Um, there have been extensive individual conversations covering a whole spectrum of public and stakeholders who have engaged with us on this project. Next slide, please. And as, as Paige had mentioned earlier, I think it's really important for me to say thank you to every member of the public who has participated in this project, um, reviewing the documents, providing comments, attending meetings, and having conversations with us. I know it takes an, an, an immense amount of time and, and personal energy. So I, I really think the recommendations that we've made are truly reflective of the feedback and respond to the feedback that the public has provided and that they are better documents because of that feedback. So thank you. Um, in the agenda package this evening, there are literally thousands of pages of emails on the project. We've spent a lot of time considering every single comment and providing responses through comment and response matrix or as direct responses for every email that we've received since the release of the second draft. Um, if the requested change made sense and it was in the scope of the project, we've made every effort to reflect that comment in the new zoning bylaw. Um, for those of the for the you know the small number of comments, relatively speaking, that haven't been addressed, we explain directly to the people why they haven't been addressed to properly close the loop. Um, so there have been a number of more recent comments that have been provided on the addendum for this evening. We've reviewed all of the comments. We have no outstanding concerns from a staff perspective. All of the feedback has been properly considered through this process and actually in many cases is already uh, proactively planned for in the zoning bylaw. So on this really large project where I've been in communication with you know, hundreds if not thousands of people, I think the few comments that we are receiving now are, are really reflective of the the vast majority of those who have participated are happy um, with the way that we've presented their feedback and reflected it in the new zoning bylaw. I've included a couple bullet points on the slide to reflect some of the remaining concerns. Um, they include proposed minimum densities on the pre-zoned subdivision lands, riparian corridors, carrying forward bedroom limitations, and maximum RV lengths from the 2019 work. We've considered this feedback and we continue to think that our proposed zoning bylaw is appropriate. I do think that there are some pieces of work that we are pretty proud of as staff that I just wanted to flag here. We've completely overhauled the project in the last 18 months. We've given parking a complete rethink and it has really been a game-changing conversation about parking. Um, we've completely overhauled the mapping, created a new interactive mapping website. We've effectively dealt with exceptions, changed the conversation about how residential uses are treated in the zoning bylaw and really created a document that is more user-friendly. Next slide, please. I'll try to quickly walk you through the eight big moves that we've made in the zoning bylaw that I think really reflect the strategic priorities of council and the vision for future growth in the city. So the zoning bylaw will help new businesses and industries thrive, sorry, <clears throat> in commercial and employment zones with simplified definitions and we've expanded the home occupation provisions. We've also added in new commercial provision permissions for uh, places of worship. Next slide, please. I said this a couple of times now, but I think it's worth restating tonight. The bylaw is called the Kingston Zoning Bylaw. We've left out the word city to truly reflect that Kingston is comprised of rural areas and urban areas, and they'll all be subject to the same unified zoning bylaw. So we have taken a rural lens with our review of the zone standards and the provisions that apply in the rural area. And we want to ensure that the new zoning bylaw helps to create a more vibrant, healthy, and diversified rural area. So we've implemented new prime agricultural area zone and expanded uses that are considered an agricultural use. We've added in new agritourism uses, rural uses on vacant lands and food truck permissions. Um, we've added in a new hamlet zone and created uh, what we expect that the car share program will actually be expanded to provide rural options for uh, rural residents. Next slide, please. Fundamentally, we've changed the focus of the residential use definition to make sure that it is inclusive and equitable. It does not focus on the people, the type or term of the ownership or the rental agreement. It focuses really on the fundamental land use. Um, the zoning by bylaw will help to ensure that housing opportunities are treated equally across the community. Next slide, please. 
The zoning by will help to support new housing uh, construction with new additional residential unit permissions that have been very carefully crafted to ensure that these units are compatible in existing neighborhoods across the city. Uh, portable tiny houses have been planned for in the context of the current OP policies. And both of these topics were just, uh, covered in a discussion paper and, and were the subject of a public meeting in June. Um, some subdivision lands have been pre-zoned with new minimum residential densities. The permissions do allow for a wide range of appropriately scaled um, housing types that will be compatible in these neighborhoods and will ensure that the future build out of these lands really helps to meet the minimum densities that are established in the OP. We've also established co-living unit permissions in, in, as per the recommendations of the Mayor's Task Force on Housing. And then obviously security will speak to the proposed intensification areas that are proposed to be up zoned through the CKGS work. Next slide, please. So the power of parking discussion paper really transformed the conversation about parking policy and created a framework that eliminates minimum parking requirements for non-residential uses, um, reduces the minimum requirements for residential uses, the bylaw supports alternative transportation modes like car share, cycling, active transportation, public transit, through really innovative and interconnected zoning provisions that have been carefully crafted to work together. The new approach uh, continues to require accessible parking, supports the creation of affordable housing and the conservation of heritage resources. So really for the first time in Kingston, our, our parking has been connected to directly to the broader strategic objectives like leadership on climate action, housing affordability, and really encouraging a desirable built form in the public realm. Next slide, please. So we did a detailed discussion paper about the natural heritage elements of the zoning bylaw, which will be protected through a new EPA zone and a 30 meter separation distance from water bodies. We've also created three new heritage zones and for the three designated heritage conservation districts. So the provisions align with the heritage district plans in those areas. Next slide, please. The source water protection policies align with the source protection plan. The floodplain overlay has been updated to, based on the most recent information available from the CRCA. The airport noise exposure implements the NEF contour of the official plan and the MDS provisions implement the provincial minimum distance separation requirements for livestock facilities. Um, railways, rail yards, pipelines, mineral aggregate re uh, resource operations are all subject to updated separation distances that are appropriate and reflect best practices for these uses. Next slide, please. So finally, the last big move in the zoning bylaw is really recognizing the existing permissions in an appropriate way. So I think we found a way to make an incredibly complex system work through the application of the not subject to this bylaw component for the old red exceptions that we had talked about at the November meeting. Um, what we proposed makes sense and was done in a, man in a manner that has been broadly supported by the community. So most importantly, we did it in a way that makes sure that the zoning bylaw applies to as much of the city as possible uh, with plans to continuously pull more of those lands into the new zoning bylaw over time. I think in the end, uh, the lands that are not subject to the bylaw make up less than 3% of the total properties in the city. So since the project was fundamentally formatted as a consolidation, it maintains the existing permissions as much as possible um, where it's appropriate based on the OP policies and it limits the creation of legal non-conforming uses. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sukriti for the CKGS. Thank you. Thank you and through you, your worship. Uh, my name is Sukriti Agarwal and I'm the manager of policy planning with the city. Um, I'm gonna start with a brief background on the Central Kingston Growth Strategy Project or what we call the CKGS in short. The CKGS, oh, I'm sorry, next slide please. Thank you. Um, the CKGS was initiated in late 2017 in response to council's consideration of an interim control bylaw that would have had the effect of prohibiting new development or alterations to residential development within the Sydenham, Portsmouth, and Williamsville electoral districts. The study area is shown in yellow on this map and includes the residentially designated areas in central Kingston that are currently regulated by zoning bylaw number 8499. WSP Canada Group Limited was retained to undertake this study. And the intent of the study was to create a policy and zoning framework to guide infill and intensification and to identify locations and forms of intensification for accommodating future residential growth. The final recommendations report prepared by WSP was presented at a planning committee meeting on August 12, 2021. Next slide, please. 
So the CKGS was a separate pro project, but still connected to the new zoning bylaw. The CKGS included recommendations for the residential zones in Central Kingston that have been integrated into the new zoning bylaw. These included the existing low density, uh, medium density, and high density residential zones, as well as new intensification areas that have been identified through the study, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Additionally, uh, um, proposed policies for the intensification areas are um, included in a new section 10G of the official plan, which is part of the proposed uh, official plan amendment. Next slide, please. The CKGS study was carried out over four phases, which included a background analysis and initial identification of intensification areas, followed by directions for the policy and zoning framework, and then final recommendations. All of these reports were posted on the project website, and there were a number of engagement events held throughout, it, throughout the course of the study, as um, you can see on this slide. The ones uh, that are bolded on the, on the slide are available as uh, recorded videos. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, one of the key components of the CKGS was to uh, identify intensification areas. There were several criteria established to assist with the selection, which included frontage along major corridors on the edges of neighborhoods, proximity to existing multi-unit or higher density developments, access to transit, access to active transportation networks, proximity of amenities, commercial uses, and institutional uses, infrastructure considerations, and community feedback from members of the public, as well as the community working group that was formed as part of this project, which really helped to determine and shape the intensification areas and the build form recommended within. So um, there were two intensification areas that are proposed to be implemented through the new zoning bylaw and the pro proposed official plan amendment and are shown on this map. These include the Johnson and Brock Street corridors west of Division Street and Portsmouth Avenue corridor north of King Street. There were two other intensification areas identified um, in, in previous um, um, which were presented at previous uh, public meetings, which have since been removed in response to the public feedback received, which I will uh, mention, um, uh, discuss later. Um, a holding symbol is proposed for all intensification areas to ensure that any servicing related matters and transportation impacts can be reviewed in greater detail and addressed prior to the intensification taking place. Next slide, please. The recommendations for the Brock and Johnson Street corridor are for multi-unit buildings for up to six stories or 20 meters in height, whichever is lesser, which a minimum, with a minimum street wall of four stories and a two meter step back above the fourth story. And the recommendations generally see the buildings as residential with, with the opportunity for neighborhood commercial uses on the ground floor level, a rear setback of 10 meters is proposed to allow for adequate separation from neighboring properties. And uh, within that 10 meter setback, a minimum two meter landscape buffer um, is also proposed. Next slide, please. Next is the Portsmouth Avenue corridor. So this area um, previously also included a portion of Johnson Street at the intersection with Portsmouth Avenue, which has been removed in response to the feedback received at um, a public meeting that was held in December of last year. This area is proposed to be further reviewed through the official plan update. For the Portsmouth Avenue corridor, the recommendations in the zoning bylaw and in the official plan are for uh, four stories or 12 meters um, in height, whichever is lesser. And, the, and these could accommodate walk-up apartments or back-to-back um, -back townhouses or stacked townhouse type of developments. For some properties that have frontage on both Portsmouth Avenue and Woodstone Crescent, um, um, the recommended zoning looks to have development ad address both of these frontages. Next slide, please. The upzoning of these areas to allow for additional housing reflects council priorities and our official plan aspirations related to climate change by allowing for intensification within the urban boundary, reducing parking requirements within these areas, encouraging um, transportation modal shift, encouraging sustainable design elements and heights that would allow for wood frame construction. As the CKGS study was advancing, there were a number of other city initiatives that had been undertaken. And the CKGS is meant to work alongside these other initiatives as well in terms of integrating the lessons learned. 
So those, those other initiatives include the Density by Design Project, which focused on a detailed analysis of the Williamsville Main Street corridor in phase one and evaluated how best to integrate more intense forms of development along Princess Street with the lower intensity areas bordering the corridor. Um, in addition, the density by design study introduced a green light strategy concept intended to ensure that intensification in appropriate locations is not impeded by unforeseen barriers and to make it easier to develop in the right places. Another study that was undertaken was the life cycle fiscal impacts of development, which was presented at council um, in June of last year, which evaluated the fiscal efficacy of various forms of development across the city and concluded that more urban tight knit multi unit built forms were the most efficient and consumed the least amount of resources. The study also showed that in a city intent on addressing climate change, promoting more of this form of development within central neighborhoods was the responsible choice. Next slide, please. Staff have received a number of questions and comments on the CKGS recommendations. The comprehensive report included written comments received as well as a comment and response matrix, which included staff's responses to those comments. And staff have endeavored to provide individual responses to Com, uh, comments received since the April 7th planning committee meeting as appropriate. The additional comments received are included in the addendum for um, tonight's meeting. Um, this slide includes some of the input received since the April 7th planning committee meeting, which have been primarily, primarily around inclusion of um, an intensification area um, uh, along Wright Crescent, um, which has since been removed. And I will be talking a little bit more about that area um, in my next slide. Um, additionally, comments have been received requesting some of the policies that are proposed for the intensification areas in section 10B, 10G, sorry, be applied citywide. And staff have also responded to those comment, comments directly as to um, why those changes uh, haven't been made. Um, next slide, please. So the Wright Crescent intensification area includes four properties with frontage on Wright Crescent and either Bath Road or Sir John A. McDonald Boulevard. Um, the previous recommendations had proposed maximum heights of 12 stories along Bath Road and Sir John A. McDonald Boulevard and six stories along Wright Crescent on these properties as shown on the slide. And as I mentioned in response to the feedback that we received, staff have removed the Wright Crescent intensification area from the new zoning bylaw and the official plan amendment at this time to be considered through a separate process and a future report. After the public meeting um, on April 7th, staff held an engagement session with area residents on April 14th and have committed to additional consultation with the residents in the coming months. And this area will now be dealt with through a separate future amendment to the zoning bylaw and the official plan. In the meantime, the equivalent zone as the existing zoning bylaw is proposed for these properties. Next slide, please. I'm now going to provide a brief summary of the proposed official plan amendment. Amendments are proposed to the OP to better enable the new zoning bylaw to implement the intent of the existing OP policies and also to implement the final policy recommendations of the CKGS with respect to identified intensification areas. Next slide, please. The proposed official plan amendment can be summarized into general themes as shown in the slide, and they include amendments related to additional residential units and tiny houses, which propose to replace second residential units with additional residential units, replacing garden suite terminology with tiny house and removing servicing constraints map from the OP and bringing it into the zoning bylaw instead. Uh, amendments to establish complementary uses for places of worship and removing funding distinctions between schools. Amendments related to transitioning riparian corridors, which are the lands within 30 meters of a water body, from a mapped designation to a text-based requirement. Amendments to establish a simpli simplified process for on-farm diversified uses and agriculture-related uses. Amendments to provide greater clarity and establish simplified processes to establish a complementary use and locations for outdoor storage within our employment areas. Uh, new policies to enable council to delegate its authority to make decisions on various minor technical amendments to the zoning bylaws. Some technical housekeeping, housekeeping amendments that do not affect the intent of the existing policies and amendments related to the CKGS that would create a new 
central Kingston specific policy area in section 10G of the official plan, along with a new map showing the proposed intensification areas. Um, next slide, please, and I will hand it back to Laura. Uh, thanks, Akriti. Um, I'll take a minute to walk through the recommendations in the supplementary report before handing off to Brent for some final remarks to end our presentation. Next slide, please. So first and foremost, um, the first three recommendations are really those that you would expect at the conclusion of these projects. The first recommendation is the approval of the two projects, including the zoning bylaw and the proposed official plan amendment, with the exception of the right crescent intensification area, which has been removed for a separate process. Um, the second recommendation speaks to the proposed official plan amendment bylaw that would implement both the CKGS and the new zoning bylaw, and those would be the recommended amendments to the official plan. The third recommendation is related specifically to the new Kingston uh, zoning bylaw, so the enactment of our final version of the zoning bylaw, including all of the schedules. Next slide, please. The four, fifth, and sixth recommendations are directly connected to the cash and parking bylaw. So the first recommendation would establish the fund that's required to deposit any of the money that's collected through the bylaw in accordance with the Planning Act. The fifth recommendation would actually pass the proposed cash and of parking bylaw and repeal the existing bylaw, which only applies in the downtown area. So the newly proposed cash and of bylaw would charge a fee of $8,000 per parking space. Um, so it would essentially allow for multi-unit residential development to provide less spaces than what are required by the zoning bylaw in exchange for the fee per parking space. And then that money would be actually used to help support the establishment of a broader car sharing system across the city. So it's really an idea to help integrate the ideas of alternative modes of transportation by allowing that money to be used to support a viable alternative. And then the sixth recommendation is actually a reduction in the application fee we charge for those cash and load parking bylaw applications. And it's really just to reflect the simplified process that we would expect through uh, as a result of the bylaw. Next slide, please. Recommendation seven is an amendment to the delegated authority bylaw for planning services. So right now there are already a, a number of Applications that are delegated to the Director of Planning Services, and through this work, we've identified a number of future amendments that we would anticipate would have to happen, and that would be technical and very minor in nature. So these include amendments to the floodplain overlay when the CRCA provides us with updated floodplain regulation information, um, the removal of constraint areas from additional residential unit overlay. So when we've been advised by Utilities Kingston that those constraint areas no longer exist, they would be removed. Um, amendments for surplus farm dwelling. So when the Committee of Adjustment uh, approves a consent application and has a condition that requires a rezoning, um, that would be a, a specific am uh, amendment that we would be delegating to the Director of Planning Services because it is very technical in nature. And then amendments that would bring red exceptions that are currently not subject to the new zoning bylaw into the new zoning bylaw where they conform with the official plan. So this new authority in the Planning Act, um, I think it's, it's really important to note that it does not remove the public notice or the public meeting requirements. What it does is actually just delegate the decision-making authority on these types of applications, including the passage of the bylaw. So any applications that would fall under these minor delegated authority would actually be required to proceed through a normal public meeting with the normal public notification, it would really just alleviate the required time and staff resources that go into actually preparing the final comprehensive report and getting those bylaws onto a council agenda because those agendas do um, get quite backed up when we look at the overall timeline on, on when we need to finalize the information. Uh, next slide, please. So the final two recommendations on this slide are uh, number eight's related actually to a two-year moratorium that's automatically established in the Planning Act when we pass a new citywide zoning bylaw. So council has the ability to pass a motion um, that would allow for individual applications, classes of applications, or all applications in general. So the two-year moratorium actually prohibits any zoning bylaw amendments within two years of passing the new zoning bylaw. So what we're recommending is that all zoning bylaw amendment applications be permitted within that two year uh, period. So that's what the, is uh, reflected in that recommendation. So since this project has been primarily for, formatted as a consolidation of the existing zoning bylaws from the very start, 
Um, I think fundamentally, a lot of the standards are still a consolidation of the existing standards, and there are intensification policies in the official plan that would allow for greater heights and densities in certain areas of the city that aren't reflected in the citywide zoning bylaw because our policies require them to be reviewed on a site-specific basis at, uh, currently. So this recommendation is that council passes a resolution allowing for all types of zoning bylaw amendments to ensure that we can continue to develop the city in a way that uh, implements the intent of the city official plan. Uh, number nine is a clause that confirms that no further public notice is required for the revisions that we've included in the supplementary report. Uh, next slide, please. So as stated in the comprehensive report, the final draft of the new Kingston zoning bylaw and the proposed official plan amendment implements and conforms with the city's official plan. It's consistent with the provincial policy statement and has regard for all matters of provincial interests that are set out in the Planning Act. Um, the, the recommendations represent good land use planning and they certainly reflect the diverse public feedback that has pr been provided through the extensive consultation on these two projects. I'll hand it over to Brent for some final remarks to end the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, I was invited uh, or asked if I had any additional thoughts to share with council at this uh, final stage in the presentation of this remarkable piece of work and, and perhaps not surprising to you, I did have a few thoughts that I wanted to share. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Madam Clerk. The first thing I thought I would do is once again, reinforce the message that you've heard from uh, your leadership team and planning department and from me uh, several times recently about the very overt approach, the very overt intention of connecting the dots between this complex piece of work and council's strategic directions and, and indeed the challenges that the city faces. It's fair to say that this is by far the largest planning work program that has ever had to connect those dots uh, in the face of this new culture of the planning department. You've heard from us in previous work programs how overtly we've tried to connect the dots. It is, um, it is absolutely true to say that the creation of a new zoning bylaw is probably the single hardest uh, thing for any planning department to do. So the, the, the nature of the challenge in connecting those dots has been remarkable. And you remember that this work program started though so many years ago, seven, I think uh, Ms. Agnew suggested, some would suggest it's been going on for even longer than that. Um, it started as a consolidation and probably the most important decision in those many years of work has been, was the decision about a year and a half ago that a simple consolidation as hard as that was and as complex as that was, was not good enough in the context of council's aspirations and ambitions and indeed the crises and challenges that the city faces. So this has been a staggeringly complex piece of work and I wanted to put some of that into context. And to start with the idea that this plan doesn't just uh, operationally significantly improve your zoning picture in the city, but it allows the zoning bylaw to be a deliberate tool in the realization of council's objectives, council's strategic goals, whether those are goals around affordability, climate change mitigation leadership, public health, transportation and walkability, or indeed economic development. That has been overtly integrated into the way the bylaw has been created and the amount of the, the, the approach to content that the zoning bylaw and indeed the other documents, uh, including the Central Kingston Growth Strategy, uh, the approaches that those have taken. Next slide, please. I thought I'd end with, with a few observations from the perspective of an outsider and hopefully after over four years advising um, the city of Kingston, you at least consider me not your typical outsider at this point. Um, as as um, Laura noted, by far the deepest level of involvement I've had in this work program is in the creation of the parking work, the power of parking document, which I co-authored with staff and that strategy. But I've also been helped, uh, requested to help with uh, strategic decisions throughout the last year and a half of the zoning bylaw and uh, the completion of the Central Kingston Growth Strategy. And I have these series of observations that I wanted to share with council. The first is that I, I hope everyone understands the, the, the fact that this document it, to my eye has become a badly needed game changer, not only in the legibility and organizational structure and manageability of the zoning bylaw, which was not a good zoning bylaw to be perfectly blunt in all those definitions of success, it's not only now a, 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 a brand new document in terms of its organizational um, um, competency, 
but it has made some very important city building decisions that will position the city very well in terms of going forward to address its strategic priorities. Secondly, as I've said, an unprecedented vision-driven connecting of all the dots, uh, and that uh, is something that I think, given the scale and complexity of these work programs, is something that is certainly worth noted. The decision to not just consolidate, but to tweak and indeed rethink many parts of the exercise has been incredibly important. And I want to, as I've done in the past, compliment staff and the leadership team at City Hall for having the culture and willingness to do that. Imagine, if you will, staff's position when they had already had years uh, of process towards trying to consolidate this zoning bylaw to suddenly a year and a half ago decide that consolidating it was not good enough, even though the almost figurative gun to, was to their head to get this work done, and instead fully embraced the idea of uh, changing the content from a tweak to a rethink perspective in a way that was badly needed for the city. I've told council before that most cities have the culture that fights um, aggressively to protect from what is called scope creep, the idea that new expectations adding on to an existing work program is something to be protected from uh, on the part of staff. In instead of um, resisting this idea of scope creep, your staff, your leadership has leaned into the idea that we frankly can't afford to do a project that doesn't actually meet your own needs and, and connect those dots to council's objectives. So rather uh, fearlessly went ahead and in the course of just a year and a half, transformed a process that had taken years and hadn't yet completed even a consolidation and managed in a year and a half to not only complete that consolation, consolidation, but also a, a substantial and fundamental tweak and rethink. That is something I have to say that I have not seen that many planning departments try to do or accomplish in the context of all the work that I do around Canada and, and indeed globally. So that is a huge compliment to your staff, to the capability of your project manager, Ms. Flaherty. Uh, but as I say, it's something that most city halls and planning departments wouldn't even be willing to take on. Um, in, in the, sorry, one sec, Council. Uh, this is gonna be a strange thing to say, but I do consider this piece of work to be a model for fast creation of zoning bylaws. There are many, many cities in Canada right now, Council, that are in the process of trying to redo their zoning bylaw and not just consolidate, but rethink them. It easily takes four to six years, easily. Uh, and so the seven year time frame that Ms. Agnew suggested is not at all unusual, but the fact that your city staff in a, in a relatively small to mid-sized city shows what you can accomplish in this in just a year and a half of fundamental rethinking. I truly believe that this work is gonna become a model for other cities across Canada, not because of the seven year time frame, but because of the year and a half time frame, where frankly, most of the work, most of the achievement and most of the innovation and creativity was actually realized. And I think, I think it would actually behoove you, and I've encouraged your staff to do this, to no longer reference this at all as a zoning process that has taken seven years. I think this is a zoning process that has actually taken a year and a half in a context where planning departments badly need to be able to go further and faster, something you've heard from me before, in the context of the many crises and challenges that cities face. It reinforces and reflects the new culture in the planning department and indeed, indeed under Ms. Hurdle's leadership uh, across, I think, City Hall. Uh, and that's something that uh, is to the credit of Ms. Agnew and what she has created. It is remarkable to think that this piece of work has been achieved in such a short period of time uh, in the last year and a half, at the same time as unprecedented approval application pressures, which I certainly know um, um, how hard that can be, at the same time as creating a significant culture change amongst staff, at the same time as essentially recrafting the planning department management team and getting new people up to speed. The significance of that accomplishment, I hope is not lost on council. From my own perspective, as someone who's seen this work done in many cities over my last 30 years, I've come away extremely impressed. Um, and I will compliment staff in the way that staff uh, usually don't feel um, allowed to compliment themselves. But I also compliment uh, the leadership team, Ms. Hurdle and Council, for really leaning in on these challenges and encouraging staff to do their best work. I think uh, I certainly have been proud to be part 
of the uh, staff team that's created this piece of work and been able to bring it to you tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much to, to staff and to Mr. Totteron for those comments and for walking us through uh, the details. Uh, while we're still in the briefing section, uh, we'll open it up to questions from council. Are there any questions? If I could, uh, if I could just get um, on my screen, uh, Councillor Osanik and Councillor Chappelle as well. Okay, if there are no questions for staff, yes, Councillor Hutchison, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had a good time, talk with Ms. Flanagan earlier today, so most of my questions are answered there. But one that came up to keep something up from the public, I'd like to ask and see if she can sketch out an answer, the, um, which is after this new bylaw comes into effect, I think people, one of the things that bothers people is that when a proposal comes forward, a development proposal comes forward, then they think that, um, you know, the bylaw shouldn't be able to be changed. And, or they're surprised if it is. And so what I was asking her about is with the new bylaw, how it would be different, but the answer seemed to be that in effect, it, it can't be. So I was wondering if she could reprise that conversation regarding the nature of proposals and their relationship to the PP, the provincial policy statement and the official plan so people can have a better idea how the process works. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Ms. Ms. Third. Uh, thank you and through you, your worship. So I think it's a great question and it's certainly something that comes up a lot when we talk about the new zoning bylaw and development applications specifically. Um, so the legislation that allows people to apply for a rezoning is actually the Planning Act. And in the Planning Act, it says any property owner has the ability to apply for a zoning bylaw amendment and that zoning bylaw amendment, the tests that they must meet are conformity with the official plan and consistency with the PPS. When they submit a zoning bylaw application, it's it's not a, a review against the zoning bylaw itself. It's really uh, the tests are established in the official plan. So I don't, I when we say that the new zoning bylaw is coming into effect, it's certainly not staff's uh, expectation that it would all of a sudden halt um, rezoning applications or, or limit um, the recommendations from a positive perspective of rezoning applications that come in because I certainly think that there would be many opportunities where a uh, rezoning application could conform with the official plan. The zoning bylaw really is only one way to implement the intent of the official plan and the official plan policies are written at a much higher, um, more broad scale. So they can be implemented in different ways on different properties. And I think that it, it isn't a failure of the zoning bylaw if a rezoning is applied for and staff recommend approval, it's an expected outcome. Um, it's just the nature of the, the planning process and the tests that are established in the Planning Act. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I just have some questions. Uh, to staff about um, the riparian corridors. So um, with this, we want to change the riparian corridors from natural heritage overlay A to B mapping, but we don't have a map of exactly which riparian corridors this is going to um, affect. So, um, <laughs> Like I know that there's some houses, even in my district, um, along Safari Drive, that are right now their backyards, or in some cases, the entire house is within that 30 meter um, ribbon of life buffer, and um, they they might want to put a shed in their backyard, and um, they'd be prevented from doing that. Um, 
um, but um, is this what's uh, what is a part of it? Like we don't have a map of uh, which areas are would be affected. So how can we answer that question back to the public? Thank you. Ms. Flirt. Uh, through you, Your Worship, thank you, Councillor Osanik. So certainly um, the riparian corridor discussion is something that we've talked about extensively on the final phase of this project. We did have a discussion paper that went to the April 29th meeting, so almost a year ago of planning committee. Um, we did have a public meeting about it, and we have uh, spent a significant amount of time reviewing the intent of the existing official plan policies and ensuring that the new zoning bylaw best implements the intent of those policies. So you're correct, the riparian corridors are proposed to be moved from um, the natural heritage A features, which are shown on schedule seven, to the natural heritage B features, which are shown on schedule eight of the official plan. And the effect of that amendment means that they're removed from the EPA land use designation and the, the proposed text, text changes actually change that from a mapped um, protection to a text-based protection in the, in the zoning bylaw. So what that really means is they are mapped. They, right now, um, they're on Schedule 7. The riparian corridors are shown on Schedule 7. And in our proposed official plan amendment that's attached to the supplementary report, um, the, the map changes on Schedule 8 actually do show the, the riparian corridors that we know about. Um, I would say that one of the big improvements that the proposed approach uh, makes on the existing OP policies is that um, our mapping is not perfect when it comes to water bodies, um, and, and especially in the rural areas, there are, are um, known mapping inconsistencies with water bodies. So right now, they actually have to be shown on a map to receive that protection. So the, the work that we've done actually recognizes that water bodies are something that change over time, and it's important that our our zoning approach is flexible and recognizes that they aren't static features in the landscape. So changing them to the text-based protection in the zoning bylaw, we think actually improves the protection for riparian corridors um, because it doesn't actually need to be mapped on schedule eight to receive that protection. Um, the, the question related to sheds on existing residential properties. So certainly we've, we've heard from a lot of residents on, on this exact topic because in the first draft, all of those properties were proposed to be in the EPA zone. So the whole intent of the work of the discussion paper was to be able to apply the underlying zoning permissions to those existing properties that are already developed. Um, so within the, the text of the zoning bylaw that's in front of you this evening, um, we actually have a recognition for existing residential lots um, in, in the urban areas of the city that they can actually have a shed within that 30 meter uh, setback, a small shed. So less than 10 square meters, so about 108 square feet, I believe. Um, and it has to just have a setback of 7.5 meters rather than the 30 meters. So we have made um, adjustments to the language and direct response to that feedback that we've received from the public. Thank you. Thank you. And um, another question is the holding provision on um, the EPA, like a holding provision that's usually, um, you know, to hold until development occurs. And so that just seems a little bit unusual to have a holding provision on the EPA. Like I want EPA to be EPA forever. <laughs> and uh, so I don't understand the holding provision. Uh, through you, uh, your worship. Thank you, Councillor Osanek. I we we completely agree with that sentiment. There there are no holding provisions that are proposed in the EPA zone. So I think there was a little bit of a some uh, miscommunication about that from a member of the public. And I I want to make sure that it's very clear that we agree that the the whole intent of the EPA zone is is really to protect those features from development. And a holding condition would mean that some form of development might be appropriate. So. So um, we haven't proposed any holding conditions in those areas. Thank you for confirming that. So my next question is through you, Your Worship, is not about um, 
uh, riparian corridors, surprisingly, <laughs> but it is about pipelines. So um, like there's four of us at council, maybe even more uh, going back to, I don't know if it was two, I think it was back in 2020, 2020 at the beginning of COVID, um, we started hearing a lot about pipelines and some of us had a tour of the pipelines that run through Kingston and we learned a lot about pipelines. Um, we're just wondering if we, just for institutions, so this would be for any new hospitals, new schools, new prisons, new long-term care homes, something of that effect, right? Like uh, we know um, through the uh, uh, the supporting documentation that was prepared tonight, the supplemental information that um, right now the setbacks are 30 meters from pipelines. If we were, like as a council, if we agree to increase that to 60 meters, let's say, right? Um, we've seen in correspondence talk about 200 meters, but if we just increased it and set a 30 to 60, um, what would be the implication? Because right now we don't have, I don't think, um, the school in Woodhaven that is close to a pipeline, that wouldn't be affected because the development application has already started. So it wouldn't affect that school. Um, you know, uh, fortunately for the school board, um, unfortunately for any counselor who wants to give more protection to the kids at that school. But it would just be future development applications that you know, we don't even have right now. So is this going to create a hardship to do a setback of 60 meters rather than 30 meters for future applications? Mr. Bark? Thank you, Andrew, Your Worship. Thanks for the question, uh, Councillor Osanic. Uh, we do have two schools uh, in the West End uh, near the pipeline. You are correct. There is one, the French Catholic School, uh, which has their development applications approved. Uh, so any zoning amendment changes uh, wouldn't affect them, but there is an additional school property located across the street. Uh, we don't have any formal development applications for that site. So any change to zoning parameters could affect the development potential of that site uh, and or necessitate the need for an application like a minor variance uh, or a rezoning in order to appropriately locate the building on that site. Um, Pipelines and major infrastructure is something to staff take very seriously when we're looking at appropriateness and setbacks and regulation to govern these uses in the city. And the regulations that we have for schools directly come from our official plan and through, uh, and then that's through uh, consultation with the actual pipeline companies themselves in implementing the federal regulations that govern pipelines. The 30 meter prescribed area around pipelines, I'm going to use two two different terms here. So the prescribed area is what the regulation says um, uh, that they're allowed to kind of review uses within it. It's 30 meters from the center of the pipe. But with the way our zoning is actually set up is that it applies to the edge of either the owned area or uh, right of way area of a pipeline. So our setbacks are actually above and beyond what's actually required uh, for the federal regulation that the pipeline's implemented. And through their review of these applications, uh, and through the zoning bylaw work, uh, they've said that what we're doing is sufficient and we can continue on with it. If we look at where the pipelines are in the city, the areas that they currently run through are north in the rural area, and then the uh, Trans Canada, or sorry, Trans Northern Pipeline kind of bisects the West End and then cuts up across the city through the employment lands. Any new proposed use for something like a prison or a hospital? Uh, would require both an amendment to the official plan and the zoning bylaw in order to be able to implement it anywhere in proximity to that pipeline. So there are no as of right permissions uh, for those types of sensitive uses near that major infrastructure. Uh, so it would be a lengthy application process where we would actually be able to review and determine appropriateness for that use to be in that area. So our regulations really only deal with the existing conditions that we have for uses that are permitted in that area, which are uh, residential uh, schools, as well as employment uses. And then in addition to that, with the Planning Act requirements and the way they're set up, we have to circulate the pipeline companies on any rezoning or land division. And then they are automatically captured in any sort of review for any development application within 200 meters of their pipeline. Uh, so there, there is, 
a, a strong lens of review focus on these pipelines to ensure that development that's happening near or in proximity to them is done in an appropriate manner. Thank you. And thank you very much for that explanation. Thank you. Okay, next is Councillor Kyle. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you, thanks to staff for this great work and all the correspondence over the number of years in question. I'm wondering tonight about the holding symbol as well, not specifically to riparian corridors, but more in concern to their use in general. Um, and I have three lines of thought on that, or three, three kind of inquiries about that. The first is, in the report, it talks about a move towards holding overlays, and I'm wondering if we could hear what the difference between an H symbol and an overlay is. Uh, through your worship, thank you, Councillor Kiley. Uh, certainly, I think it's a great question. So, um, traditionally, zoning bylaws, uh, obviously, our existing zoning bylaws, which are 45 years old, which, which were probably drafted um, maybe by hand initially and then transferred over to a CAD file and then slowly transitioned into a, a GIS file. So, um, as you can imagine, they were traditionally all on one flat map. So, all of the zoning information was presented on one map, um, you know, with our interactive mapping that we've enabled over, over the years with the GIS platform and specifically over the last 18 months, we've broken out the, the traditional approach to zoning by really creating a series of maps. So um, functionally, uh, there is no change in, in the approach. It, it functions in the exact same way in the text of the zoning bylaw. H lift applications will be, um, will be, go through the exact same process that they currently go through. It just looks different. It, it's a lot of, it's a much cleaner set of maps to have it separated out onto its own overlay. And it also allowed us to create um, a lot of data in the background on those interactive maps so that um, when someone's using the interactive map, they can actually click on the, the shape that the holding condition is and a window will pop up with the actual text of the conditions that need to be met before the H can be lifted. So um, the data just works a lot better breaking it out into an overlay but functionally it works the exact same way. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And through you, Mayor Patterson, just following up on that then, I'm glad to hear, first of all, that it's the same feature, but just a technical difference. I'm wondering in the supplemental report then, uh, this is on page 17, it talks about holding symbols. And I'll just quickly read it. It says, the implementing zoning bylaw may include a holding symbol A, to ensure the availability of servicing, and B, for the purposes of requiring a transportation impact study. Does that mean those are the only two reasons why we could use an H symbol going forward? Or are all the other reasons, especially on environmental issues, uh, to be transparent about my, my thinking behind it, but um, why are we referencing only servicing and transportation in the supplemental report? Um, I, I'd have to double check the exact reference, or sorry, through you, Your Worship, I'd actually have to double check the exact reference in the supplemental report. Um, at a high level, no, those are not the only conditions that can be applied through an H. There, there certainly are a wide range of conditions that are applied. We have general H conditions, which are, are um, a lot more generalized based on the existing H. Uh, H conditions in the existing zoning bylaws. I think over the years, um, through site-specific rezoning applications, we've become uh, a lot more specific in the specific requirements that must be met. So H conditions are applied for a broad number of reasons, and, and certainly um, the approach in the new zoning bylaw will continue to allow a, a broad range of reason, reasons with those H conditions. Okay, yeah, and I apologize for putting you on the spot with that particular reference. Maybe, if you don't mind, if we come back to it in debate, I might ask again just to be very clear because, it, it, you know, I'm reading it there and just want a bit more clarity. And then finally, I believe I asked you this before, but for the benefit perhaps of those watching, in terms of new provincial legislation on H symbols and the ways in which uh, Queen's Park has said we can delegate H symbols to staff, can you clarify how the new zoning bylaw relates to what council can do with H symbols or not d due to that new that new law or set of laws? Uh, through you, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor Kiley. Um, we're not proposing any amendments uh, through this work to the to the delegation of 
H lift applications. So the existing delegated authority bylaw uh, already delegates the application to the director of planning services, but it does go to council to actually pass the bylaw and through this work, we aren't proposing any amendments to that. Perfect, thank you very much and great work. Thank you. Okay, next on my list is Council McLaren. Thank you. So one of the biggest concerns that uh, has been raised in, by people in my district, specifically Strathcona Park, is that every resident will now have the right, or has a right, to extra units on their land. Um, first, may I ask, is that correct? Uh, through you, Worship, I, I can jump in on this question as well. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, that's correct. So through the, the work in the new zoning bylaw project, we did do a discussion paper about additional residential units, uh, tiny houses and shipping containers. So we did have a public meeting about that um, in June of uh, 2021. Um, the legislation in the Planning Act changed in 2019. So formerly what was the second residential unit legislation was actually changed to additional residential units. So right now our existing zoning bylaws implement the former second residential unit legislation, which really allows for a main unit plus one second unit. Um, the work that we're proposing through the new zoning bylaw is um, permitting one main unit plus two uh, second units, so a second unit and a third unit on the property, which uh, is required by the Planning Act. And, and we've proposed to maintain all of the same restrictions that currently apply to second residential units, which have been refined over the, the course of the last three years that we've had the second residential unit provisions in effect. And um, they will be subject to the same bedroom limitation that, that we've proposed. So there's no changes proposed to the bedroom limitation. Uh, there's a maximum of eight bedrooms per lot, regardless of whether it's one, two, or three units. Um, we do have a restriction on the, the uh, additional residential units. So a maximum of one of those units can be detached in the, the backyard and a maximum of one can be attached to the main building. So either as an addition or within the basement of that building, um, within the detached unit in the backyard, uh, there are specific restrictions on the size and scale of that building. So there's a one story height limit, uh, which is also set at 4.6 meters, a 10% lot coverage, and there are specific uh, setback requirements from lot lines for those detached units. So there are uh, a series of restrictions that apply specifically to those detached detached units to ensure that they're compatible in, in the neighborhoods that they would fit. So it sounds like you have put in uh, as many restrictions as possible um, to preserve like the character of the neighborhood. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, certainly, I think that's correct. I think, um, you know, initially the, the second residential unit permissions that are currently in our existing zoning bylaws, they, they were uh, implemented originally in 2019. And over the course of the actual last year, so I believe in early 2021, we had proposed a series of amendments to those existing second residential unit permissions. So um, what we found was, in our experiences with seeing the detached second residential units uh, being constructed in, in neighborhoods, we, we felt that a number of amendments were required to ensure that the zoning bylaw really ensures that they're compatible within those neighborhoods. So um, the work that we've done in the new zoning bylaw very much is consistent with those updates that we proposed. And I think that um, when we look at the restrictions that are in place and, and the way that uh, we've implemented the zoning for the additional residential units, we've done it very thoughtfully and intentionally with, with our experiences already with the second residential units. So we really do think that they will integrate compatibly within those neighborhoods. Thank you. And lastly, um, are there any capacity limits to Strathcona Park? So if we were to triple the population over, say, the next several years, are there any other restrictions that might um, come into play, such as um, sewer capacity or uh, space on streets for parking? Uh, 
uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for the, the question. I'm just double checking the additional residential unit overlay on, on our interactive zoning map here for Strathcona Park. Uh, if you could just give me one second. So we do have a, a actual overlay um, schedule D1 and D2 to the new zoning bylaw includes a number of constraint areas where there are, are different servicing or infrastructure constraints that are known. Um, so we've consulted with Utilities Kingston on these constraint areas and I'm just double checking to see if um, Strathcona Park is in any of those constraint areas. Um, there is one area along the, the western boundary of Strathcona Park, so um, along the east side of Portsmouth Avenue from John Counter Boulevard all the way down to Princess Street um, where there is a constraint area. Um, I believe the constraint is there's sewer surcharging. Um, so within that sewer surcharging area, they would not have the permissions for the additional residential units and, and that specific constraint. It's not a holding constraint, it's just a constraint. So they would not be able to have an additional residential unit in that area. Okay, thank you. Uh, next on my list is uh, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and thank you very much for all the amazing work. Um, the question I have, I guess it's a good follow-up to Councillor McLaren's. It, it is in relation to King's Court. And um, the one of the themes, main themes, I mean, this was through density by design, I suppose, but also in the CKGS on uh, proportionality and, and with intensification. So the King's Court area obviously is adjacent to the site for CKGS and um, I've been hearing from residents who have been wondering all along about any impacts um, that could be expected given the housing pressures on the area and the fact that it's not included in the CKGS. So um, I was just wondering if staff could speak to that to any potential um, protections in terms of um, you know, any any uh, the, the lot sizes here being quite small, and uh, those kinds of uh, proportional questions. The second one. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Councillor Holland, for that question. Um, so for the Kings Court area, there have been no intensification areas identified through the CKGS. However, um, for Kingston, uh, sorry, for Kings Court, uh, we did create a new zone category specifically um, to uh, address the build form of the area um, with uh, and specifically related to the front yard. So as, as you may be aware, the front yard setbacks within the area are quite varied. So we have specifically crafted the zoning category for that area that addresses that. Um, and then also, as, as, as Ms. Flaherty mentioned, um, there are permissions for additional residential units that would apply to that area as well. However, there are regulations uh, included within the zoning bylaw to ensure that any detached uh, second or third residential unit is uh, compatible with the surrounding um, area. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. A uh, quick follow-up uh, to Councillor Osanek's questions regarding pipelines and proximity. Um, so this would probably be for Mr. Barr. I know when we do a plan of subdivision, we often insist upon a piece of property being identified as a, pot a potential school site. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that creates in the process a right to build or if we adjust the pipeline setbacks uh, would they have a for right to build on that site or not? Mr. Barr. Thank you and through you, Your Worship. Uh, the Cat West Secondary Plan, which is I think what all we're talking about the most, has 
been in the works since 2003. It's been a long time coming. It's, you know, it was first constructed as a secondary plan, uh, created its whole own, own official plan, a plan layer. Uh, the zoning came into effect for it. And the lands that are currently there are zoned for uh, the use of a school in the specific location that is identified as that. If the provisions, regulations were changed in order to say, instead of a 30 meter setback, a 60 meter setback, landowners would have the ability to uh, appeal that to the Ontario Land Tribunal should they not like the, the new regulation that has been imposed on them uh, within the prescribed timeline and the passing of the zoning bylaw. Uh, but additionally, while the use might still be permitted, the zone regulation might make it a challenge. So it would either necessitate uh, them to rethink their, their building strategy or to walk away from it, or to submit an application for a minor variance uh, or zoning bylaw amendment, depending on what that regulation would say. Uh, so it kind of opens up the, the box a little bit further to a couple other reactions potentially uh, from landowners in that area who currently have permissions and regulations that are set and in effect and have been there for a number of years. So I guess if we come forward with an extension on the setback requirement, which I personally would support, um, it would be important to have staff identify any of those. It almost sounds like an existing prior uh, use if they've been granted the expectation of building a school on that site. Is that accurate, Mr. Brod? Thank you, and through your worship, uh, Councilor Nino, can you just clarify the question that you're asking there at the end? I don't think I have a full comprehension on how to respond. You just repeat the question, Councilor Nino. Yeah, if if we were to extend, say, to 50 meters, the setback requirement, but a school board had already expressed an intent for a piece of property that was. Uh, that was identified through a plan of subdivision, would they have a right to build on that site or uh, or not? That basically is my question. Thank you, and through your worship. Uh, yeah, yes, if a, if a land has been identified for uh, development as a school, it's specifically been parsed in size for a school and its zoning permits a school as well as its official plan designation. The intent long-term would be to build a school there and the regulations would permit it. Uh, if setbacks changed, if those regulations that govern that use change, um, either for uh, you know increased setbacks or decreased setbacks that could affect the development uh, potential of a site, um, the person who owns that site would have to figure out whether or not those regulations work for them in their development portfolio. Um, and, and if it didn't, then they would necessitate the need for an application to try and come in for it because the use would still be permitted on the property. It would just be the regulations that might have to change. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick question for Ms. Flaherty, if I could. And I apologize. I thought I was 20 minutes early and in fact I was 20 minutes late today. So I, you may have touched on this at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, but what do you anticipate the timeline uh, if this is as often happens, we're facing some appeals process uh, and would those appeals be specific to one portion of it or would it delay the whole uh, process uh, being agreed to or not? Ms. Flaherty. Uh, through your, your worship and thank you, Councillor Neal, I think uh, Ms. Morley might be the appropriate person to actually respond to this question. So I'm gonna actually hand it off to Ms. Morley for this one. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. You have asked the million dollar questions of what will be appealed and how long will we be delayed for. Unfortunately, I can't really answer those questions with any degree of specificity other than to say that under the Planning Act, once there has been an appeal, the bylaw does not come into force until all of the appeals have been disposed of. 
However, there is a mechanism under the Planning Act for the city to bring a motion to have all of the unappealed portions of the zoning bylaw brought into force while certain issues are being appealed. Of course, if the entirety of the zoning bylaw is appealed for a very comprehensive appeal, that means the entire thing wouldn't come into force until that appeal was dealt with. So you are going to be busy in the next year. Thank you very much. Next is Councillor Hill. Thank you, Your Worship. And I want to thank staff for the incredible work that they've done. What a complex file and obviously, you know, you, you know incredible amount of time and, and energy. And you put a lie to the adage that you can't fight City Hall because you've been re really responsive to some of the things that folks have been asking for. So we really appreciate that. But, you know, there is criticism, right? And, and, and one of the things that uh, uh, I've heard uh, uh, is that we are planning to be a city that we're not. So uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, particularly around uh, um, density, that that Kingston really is a small city and we've relied on, on expertise from, and very good expertise I might add, from people like Mr. Tadarian, who come from a large city and would plan for a large city. So for example, uh, you know, in, in, in a city like Vancouver, uh, if you wanted to live in a low-rise residential, well, you, you need to move to Abbotsford or you need to, to move to Maple Ridge. And that, for a lot of folks, that's not really convenient to do. So intensity or density in, in, um, increases there make, make a lot of sense. But in Kingston, it's a small city that is uh, bordered by, by folks like, uh, communities like uh, Amherstview or Gananoque that don't have the same restrictions that we have around density. So if we implement all of this density, uh, the density provisions, do we run the risk of, of driving developers out of our city and into the neighboring municipalities that are only really about 15 to 20 minutes away? Uh, so, that, so that convenience is, is, uh, is not as much of a factor as it might be in a larger city. So, I, I'm, I'm going to give a, a, I'd like you to just sort of respond to that in general, in broad terms, and then I, I want to give you kind of an, an example of what I'm talking about. Commissioner Egg. Uh, thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Uh, great question, Councillor Hill, and it's certainly a, a question or some feedback that we have heard through various stakeholders throughout the process. You know, I think. I think this council in itself has sort of answered that question for us or redefined how we've seen ourselves as a city. We, we may be a mid-sized city, certainly, but we're also one that we've also seen in the last uh, number of years and in the last census period in particular have 7% growth, which is one of the fastest in the country. We've also had increases in our affordability issues um, that you know are putting us on par with, with larger cities. So. We may, you know, be a, a city that's 150 or 160,000, but um, I think aspirationally, this this council has also said that we're one that's cl that's claimed a climate change emergency, and um, we're trying to be responsive to that, and we're also trying to be responsive to the city's overall goal of being very smart, growth oriented, and taking into consideration. Um, all of the work that's led to where we are today in, in terms of some of the life cycle analysis and as we get prepared to have our next discussions on development charges and asset management, these are all interrelated topics. So I think I think what we're seeing is, is some of the density requirements that we're looking at trying to implement through pre-zoning these lands in particular. And I think that's what's drawn some of the, the questions of concern is that we're actually looking for neighborhoods to be more mixed and to have a variety of housing forms so that there is greater opportunity for different types of people to all reside within the same area with different ranges of affordability in particular. But most importantly, on the, on the climate change front, uh, we're looking at how to create you know, a, a higher yield of housing within the same stretch of land than maybe what was important to the city 10 or 15 years ago prior to being aware of, of some of the, the aspirational pieces on climate change and its commitments, but also more so even in terms of the commitments the city's already made on transit. Some of the densities that we're looking to try to incorporate through the zoning really represent our way of achieving 
sizes of neighborhoods that are actually transit supportive. So the the numbers that we've that we've incorporated come directly as minimum densities to be able to support transit ridership in those neighborhoods, and that wouldn't even be rapid transit. That would be some transit. So. Again, I know there, there can be difficulty, and certainly Mr. Totteran's heard this, this as well. He is a resident of Vancouver. He's, he's worked in big cities. Um, and certainly there, there is some of his thinking that has challenged us, but again, made in Kingston solutions, I don't think we're looking at some of the density requirements that you'd see in larger cities, but we are trying to ensure that we have the tools in place that actually help us to meet the commitments that councils asked us to meet looking at maximizing the use of the land that we have available within the city's boundary as efficiently as possible. So I know that's, that's sort of a high level uh, overall question and answer, but I'm happy to get into greater detail if, if you wanna dive deeper into it, Councillor Hill, but thank you for the question. So, so I'm gonna go next to uh, uh, Mr. Totter and put his hand up and then to Celia Hurdle as well. Mr. Totter. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to Council, and uh, my apologies for having to put up my hand physically. I wasn't able to find the button. Uh, I can say um, uh, honestly and completely non-defensively that I always remind uh, folks in Kingston that I'm not from a big city. I'm from Perth, Ontario. I just now live in a big city, and I plan for cities of all sizes and scales, and that's super important in the context of work like this. I particularly like working in small cities or smaller cities, if you will. Uh, I've said this to you before in the context of other work. Kingston, notwithstanding the aspirations of council uh, around being Ontario's first city to declare a climate emergency, for example, et cetera, is still not necessarily at the point where uh, it can or should be at the bleeding edge of the kinds of innovations we might be talking about. I, as I've, I think I've described uh, the work that we've done in other contexts as not necessarily best practice, uh, but good practice. And I would say that that is uh, true of this piece of work as well. I think it's gonna be a very interesting conversation for you when you move from this zoning bylaw to the new official plan because it is with that document that there will probably be much more robust conversations around what the city is ready to be and how, and, and as I've said to you before, the tough choices that will be necessary, the hard parts around making that statement of climate emergency declaration a reality, for example. But there's nothing in this document that, uh, I, in my opinion, goes beyond um, uh, a made in Kingston solution and nothing that takes the city into a, a bleeding edge scenario. That is quite deliberate in terms of certainly the advice I've given, but more importantly, it's 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 in keeping with the, with the vision and the direction that your leaders have. So this has been very much a council uh, vision driven exercise and a city leadership exercise. I say that because I wanna dissuade any notion that this is some big city planner thinking. This is a fellow who grew up very close to you in Kingston, in Perth, uh, who is working in scale, cities of every scale and, and can confirm without reservation that this solution is an ambitious solution, an ambitious piece of work, but completely in the context of council's own stated aspirations. See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, my comments actually are gonna be in the context of our current uh, zoning situation. So members of council are all aware that we are already seeing single family homes being built in Amherstview or South Frontenac, et cetera. And that's with our current um, zoning situation. This zoning is not going to change what we are seeing or what's been happening for a number of years. I would offer that what has been happening for a number of years is in part due to the fact there there is limited ownership of the land that we have uh, remaining, green land that we have remaining in, in the city of Kingston boundary, urban boundaries. So that has definitely um, pushed some developers to look outside because they do not currently own uh, land that are located within the urban boundaries. So it, it's something that's been happening for a number of years. This bylaw will not change that or increase the number of developers going outside of our city. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and I, I certainly, I hope I didn't suggest anything other than that Mr. Totteran was doing tremendous work, but that we have heard that criticism. 
So I'm going to dive down a little bit deeper and look at just a, a couple of specific examples in the West End. We have some long-standing uh, uh, um, low-rise residential developments that are happening. So one at least has been ongoing for 10 years. So the concern that I heard from the developers in that area were, is that um, these are planned communities that are now all of a sudden going to have to change dramatically from having low-rise development to uh, on, the, on, the, on the sort of new borders of those developments, uh, high-rises. Is that what this density, these density provisions mean or, or are, uh, is that, that being overstated in, in, in terms of, uh, of what we're asking of, of contractors, number one? And number two, are there any protections for these developments that have been long-standing and are and are uh, have been underway for for some time, Commissioner Agnew. Yeah, thank you, and through you, and, and certainly I'll start, and then if some of my colleagues have any additional information to offer. Um, in terms of the lens, I think we're talking about the, the Cataraqui West Secondary Plan that's now, uh, it's really been renamed over time to be called Woodhaven. And as Mr. Barr indicated, the secondary plan for Woodhaven, I believe it started in 2003, it started before I moved to Kingston and it was in development at that time. And that was creating a, a secondary plan document that was uh, a collaboration of multiple property owners and sort of working through things with the city of Kingston. And there was a plan that went forward that was that high level secondary plan thinking that became a subset of the official plan as Mr. Barr indicated. So what you've seen over the last number of years is that that vision for that area breaking out in a phase by phase basis. So it comes forward by way of, of plans of subdivision draft plans um, you know, at the rate that the property owners wish to bring them forward. And that's not something that's in the control of the city. I think um, with respect to the lands that we're talking about here, uh, we, we made the decision from a staff perspective, looking at where we were with respect to um, housing pressures and challenges overall, and realized that by taking a couple of extra months in delivering you the work that's there tonight, we could pre-zone lands, which is not something that we did widely through this project, but because these lands had gone through a secondary plan, we thought in terms of expediting development, if we pre-zone the lands, it avoids the property owner having to go through a lengthy and expensive process and that they could just move forward with their draft plan as opposed to having to do the zoning process. But in doing so, we were utilizing the policies of the secondary plan, which give density ranges that the area is supposed to achieve within the life of its build out. So we're not superimposing anything new. We've asked for them to be more in the, the higher end of the range than what the property owners previously had been building out at. And some of the inspiration for this um, also came with Councilor McLaren in the room. He may have recalled the conversations we had around the Creekside Valley subdivision in, I think, 2017. And council's concerned that we are building out at a density of 21 or 21 or 22 units per net hectare when the official plan was really asking new developments to come in at 37 and a half. Again, looking at smart utilization of land, transit supportive. So, and, and looking at creating, because we are pre-zoning these lands for the property owner, we all wanted to ensure reciprocally that what was going to be developed there was reflective of, you know, a, a higher utilization of the land, given the fact that we're trying to, you know, work within the existing boundary of the city and the finite amount of land that remains in Cataraqui West, um, but while working within the provisions of the secondary plan policies so that we were still in conformance with this with the official plan. So from that standpoint, you know, we're not creating anything new. I think there's been a concern that we're somehow permitting uh, high rise buildings. That's not the case. We've proposed two categories of zoning. One is a lower density that allows some additional housing forms, single semis, townhouses. Um, and in particular, what we've said to those property owners is that some of the density requirement, we thought they could meet more easily by the addition of additional residential units. So instead of just developing with one home, there would be the, the opportunity to have a secondary unit or potentially a tertiary in the back as an option if they wanted to explore that, or a greater mix of uses that would look at 
singles, semis, and townhouses to help get up the density, or even small unit apartment buildings that would have a maximum of four units. There is a height restriction that already exists in the secondary plan for that area. So all of the zoning provisions that we brought forward um, you know, as a city initiating that for the developer instead of doing it themselves was all within the parameters of the policy framework that's already been established or well established for this for this land. With respect to the fact if the developer has drawn draft plans for lands that weren't pre-zoned, I can't speak to that. It's potentially true that they have done that. However, the city in this process has taken a major development hurdle off the table for them and done so in a manner that should help to expedite the process. If they need to make modifications to their design plans, again, that's more of an operational detail that I can't speak to, but the policy that we've put in place is in respect to the approvals at the official plan level that the city put in place in 2003, and we worked within those confines because we have to. Uh, we can't bring in zoning that doesn't uh, conform to the official plan. So I know that was a lot of information, Councillor. If there's any additional information we can offer, happy to do so, but uh, just let me know. No, thank you. That's, uh, that's great. I appreciate that. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions during the briefing? Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a, a quick question. I asked the question at the planning meeting about trailer length for uh, parking in residential areas for that period where, you know, if someone's prepping their trailer for the long weekend and then they're moving it off site. And uh, it was proposed to, to be 8.7 meters and I requested it to be nine meters. And then the answer that came back in the, in the supplemental report was, oh, please review report PC 19-055. So I just wanna confirm that uh, 19 meters will be permitted for, or sorry, nine meters will be permitted for a trailer and residential properties. Uh, that's the first question I have. Ms. Flaherty. Uh, through you, Your Worship, thank you, Councillor Chappelle. So um, the, the parking of the recreational vehicles and the commercial vehicles was specifically pulled out of the new zoning bylaw project when it was put on hold to ensure that that work could be expedited in 2019 because there was a desire to get the existing zoning bylaws updated to um, before the new zoning bylaw came into effect. So the provisions in the new zoning bylaw that we're proposing are the exact same standards that were approved in 2019 as a result of that detailed technical review and public consultation process. When we had scoped the new zoning bylaw project, the third and final phase of this, um, we we had tried to really focus our staff resources on work that hasn't recently been updated and recently been subject to uh, full public consultation and council approval. So the, the request to um, arbitrarily change the the number from 8.2 to 9.0. We, we don't have the technical review done at a staff level within the context of this project because we haven't focused our resources on that element because it has been recently um, reviewed. So the our response in the supplementary report is, is to confirm that the standard that we're proposing in the zoning bylaw that's uh, proposed for council tonight maintains that 8.2 meter length for those recreational vehicles because as staff, I think it's really important that um, there, there was a very specific rationale for including the 8.2 meters in 2019 and, and to, to change it could have a significant impact that we haven't had the opportunity to review. It might be something that we, we could support at some point in time if, if we reviewed um, the implications of that, but in, in the less than one week, uh, including the four day Easter holiday to complete the supplementary report following the planning committee meeting, we certainly didn't have the ability to do a fulsome technical review of, of that type of change in, in the, this context. Thank you. So, so, so to clarify then, um, Cuts, what Cuts, you're Cuts, telling me. I'm just gonna put you on pause for a minute because there's somebody else, there's another hand raised and then I'll come back to you. Uh, Commissioner Agnew. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Councillor Chappelle, maybe just a little bit of information. So the, the last process that we went through in 2019 that Laura was speaking to with respect to uh, recreational vehicles, boats, those types of things, and looking at setting the parameters for the maximum length, that was really a function of balancing 
you know, what could reasonably fit within a municipal, uh, sorry, a private uh, driveway without hanging over onto the municipal right of way, but more so a function of being able to at all times maintain appropriate sight lines so that when people are, are driving through, if there's an extra long trailer hanging out onto the municipal right of way, would people be able to move in and out of their property if there's you know children or pedestrians walking and, and be able to have the sight lines to be able to to look at that so i know um that that was a primary reason that was factored into the regulation of of uh of the maximum vehicle lengths as part of those amendments that were done in 2019 but recognizing in this circumstance there's a particular resident that feels that uh, that the length that has been imposed is is too short relative to maybe his personal circumstance or what he thinks is more of a standard size uh, recreation vehicle in the community. Councilor Chappell. So just to reflect back, what I'm hearing is that it's going to remain at 8.2, and that uh, just buy a smaller trailer or boat if you wanted to park it in your driveway if you have sufficient space. Um, that I. I I would have thought that it was um, council that recommends the length uh, in, in addressing these items. So it, I would have preferred to have amended that to nine meters at that planning committee meeting. But anyways, my next question, it relates to this particular uh, draft um, zoning bylaw. And that is uh, when it comes into effect, because I do have a resident that is anxiously waiting on Highway 15 to open up a commercial business and uh, was advised to wait till the new zoning bylaw came into effect. So if I was to offer her advice as to when she can file her application for that new business to get moving, um, could she possibly do that as early as this week or should she wait until all potential appeals have gone through? Commissioner Agnew? <laughs> Uh, thank you and through you and that's a difficult circumstance councillor i would say that what's presented to council this evening if if council is happy to make a decision based on the staff recommendations that are before you that the bylaws uh all the enacting bylaws be giving three readings tonight which would mean um if that proceeded they would approve and then we would go into the 20-day appeal period that's mandatory in ontario under the planning act so it would depend on if we receive any appeals within the 20 days and the nature of them, whether they're you know all encompassing as Ms. Ms. Morley indicated, or if they're specific, um, that would determine the length of time that the, the bylaw would essentially be in abeyance. But um, we're hopeful that there won't be any appeals, but in all likelihood, I think we may receive something. So uh, it's going to be at least a couple of months, I would say at the very least, if there is an appeal if not longer. Um, otherwise, if there's no appeals, then then the bylaw would fully be in effect after the 20-day appeal period expires following a council decision. Okay, so if I was to advise when to have this resident apply for this zoning for this business that has been held off now for over a year, um, should I advise to wait at least 20 days before filing? Or like, I'm just, you know, you, it's, it's impacting a, an economic decision. And so my question really is, if, if we wait 20 days and if there is an appeal and that doesn't really impact the area that she has her business, would she be able to proceed under this bylaw that if it passes tonight, or does it create all kinds of extra problems? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, I'm not sure how to answer that question, like completely accurately, because it would depend. And I guess in the circumstance of the property owners looking to take advantage of some of the new zoning provisions, and that is, is what they're waiting for relative to filing their application. Is that, is that the case, Councillor Chappelle? Yes, it was advised that a zoning application would have taken probably six months to get the amendment that was already being proposed in this new bylaw, new zoning bylaw. So wait till the new zoning bylaw was passed. But now I'm learning that there's these extra complexities. So I'm trying to be supportive of the new business owner that wants to get started. It's already been delayed uh, substantively. So that, that's really what I was trying to couch on how I help position to be most effective as a representative, that's all. 
I think perhaps what I could suggest, Councillor, is, is that um, I'm happy to, or Mr. Park, to, to offline this with you and connect with that individual and, and help guide them through that conversation uh, post-meeting tonight. I know that doesn't give you an answer directly right now, but that would probably be the best just so we can know the nuances of the situation and then and to help to, to do whatever we can to help guide the situation appropriately. I'm very satisfied with that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Agnew. Um, I, I guess the final question I have relates to uh, what the, the density requirements in the West Haven area. The, the uh, Councillor Hill spoke eloquently tonight on how he framed this, this, the situation. And I applaud him for taking a note of this particular area because at the north end of, of um, the Woodhaven subdivision, I'm not talking about what recently came to planning towards Bayview and Princess. I'm talking about the north end where the plans have already been sort of laid out and the density is substantively increased, um, which creates complexities for the developer. So I, I don't understand how we can sort of change the rules of the game towards the end of their development cycle. And, you know, certainly knowing the rules going forward makes a lot of sense, but when you've got a, you know, a development that's happening, it, it makes it very difficult. So I'd like to understand where in the city is the densest community that is still, uh, that has, you know, greater than, you know, of, of 70 or sorry, 37, units per hectare, where, where do we have that currently existing in the city of Kingston? Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, if, if it's all right for me to, to begin, and then I'll invite anybody else into the conversation in terms of my colleagues, if I've missed any details. Um, in terms of actual numbers, the most recent example I can think of would be West Village, which is in behind um, the, uh, the Rio Can Center, the big box development. There, and that was actually a conversion of employment lands, if councillors may remember, there was some old industrial there and, and a brownfield site. So that is the most recent newer large scale development that we were able to kind of craft from the, from the very beginning um, in terms of more recent thinking on planning versus some of the existing secondary plan areas. As you can imagine, our priorities from like 2003 as a city to where we are uh, now in 2022 uh, some of the pressures are different um, that we're facing now. And, and the thinking around smart growth and, and climate change is certainly very different from what it was. But through West Village, um, in order to secure staff support, we had originally looked to try to have a density of around 50 uh, units per net hectare overall. And that was a blend of different types of uses. And there are some high density blocks that are factored into that development approval. Uh, they haven't been built out yet, but that was a, that was built into the approval as well as the school site. And there's a long-term care facility. So it was really planned as a, as a mixed complete community. Um, other than that, um, everything else that is low density for the most part has already been part of like previous master planning or was in uh, you know draft plan a subdivision stage. A lot of the newer development we're seeing with the higher densities are more corridor based uh, multi-residential development versus low density. So West Village would be the most recent example that I can point to of of where, again, through the zoning, we were, we were looking and through the official plan policies we passed there to secure um, minimum densities for all the same reasons that we're trying to apply to the, the pre-zoned Woodhaven lands that we're discussing tonight as part of the recommendations. So when I reflect on that, it, I understand and it makes sense. You know, we had changing elements happening. Uh, we, we got the, the new school uh, being, being developed in that area. And, and you know you're right at the ground level getting rolling with a with a project that basically started much later probably a few years ago and is now moving forward versus Woodhaven that started well over a decade ago and was rolling out in phases so I'm just perplexed as to why we would you know we were talking you mentioned it many times tonight about a mix of different uh, different frames, forms of a, a building for affordability, you know, and this land is pre-zoned uh, already and, and we're changing it. So I just, I just find it complex because when I look at areas where they had increased density substantively in Woodhaven, and I'm thinking of like Jeanette Street and other areas that really, I get a lot of calls about issues with parking and what have you. 
that greater flexibility to have a mix of single semis and towns, to me, allows for greater opportunity for road parking, greater opportunity for, for stuff. And, and keep in mind, transit is only arriving this September, and, and that northern part is still, you know, that, that'll be eventually a future expansion. So I'm just wondering how, how uh, staff would feel if that was removed and allowed to retain its existing um, uh, density uh, requirements rather than imposing this new density requirement on them. Uh, thank you and through you. So, so just for clarity, the lands we're talking about right now, they're, they're not, they're not zoned. Uh, they're zoned in, in a holding category, but they actually don't have the detailed zoning on them. That's what we were proposing to do for the property owner through this process to expedite the housing development. I think to your, your key question, Councillor Chappelle, where from a staff perspective, the only difference of what we're doing here, again, we're, we're not imposing anything higher than what the official plan already says for this area. The difference is we're trying to tie it to zoning. And what we've found in the past is if we've just had a target that's in the official plan, and this is true of uh, the earlier phases of Woodhaven in particular, and, and I think contributed to some of the challenge of concentration of certain types of units in only one section of, of the development is that if we don't have a requirement in the zoning, what happens is it's the market that dictates the form of housing that develops within each subsequent section. And um, therefore, if the market's calling only for you know, small singles, um, then maybe that's all that's been built versus what we're trying to build now into the zoning is to have some type of assurance that there's actually going to be a unit mix and at a yield that shows you know, relative efficient use of the land and a consideration of a mixed housing form so that there's various price points. The other challenge that we've seen too, uh, our official plan policy for new greenfield development that applies to Cataraqui West is that it requires all new greenfield development to have a minimum of 25% affordable housing. And that's the CMHC version. But what we have found too is that without requiring that unit mix per kind of mini subdivision that some of the the more affordable types of housing were being delayed to the very end stages so as opposed to them developing out in an area by area basis they're developing out only in one later stage to meet that requirement so again from a a mixed unit perspective we we're trying to ensure that we were securing what the official plan already asks for in a way that gives the city some assurance versus just allowing the mar market more so to dictate only what's being built in that area. However, I will say that um, the use of, of this type of density uh, requirement in lower density forms of housing, we do often use it in higher density. It is a newer practice for the city and one that, uh, that I know that is probably giving council some pause, but I've tried to explain the reasons of what we're trying to do, why we're trying to utilize that to achieve what our official plan already says and to make sure that we can actually realize that through the zoning as opposed to uh, having no control, uh, which is typically what, what we have in, in other circumstances of the unit to mix that gets built out in a particular area. And we've tried to learn from that mistake, quite frankly, as a city and, and implement a bit of a, a revised process as a result, particularly on the unit mix and the affordability front. Well. I'm not sure about affordability, even for a semi or a townhouse today. It's, it's incredibly crazy. Um, well, I appreciate your perspective on that. I just, I just have some consternation with respect to, to bringing forward that increased density, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from Council? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you very much uh, to, to staff for that briefing and now we'll move to, um, to item one. Uh, under report number 42, supplementary report uh, to PC 22-018, comprehensive report, new zoning bylaw project and central Kingston growth strategy. So the bylaw is now on the floor. Is there any discussion? Council McLaren. Thank you. So um, I have some still concerns about the um, additional rental units. Uh, if we were to 
pull that section out of the bylaw for further consultation. May I ask, how much consultation has already been done on that particular aspect of it? Ms. Flaherty. Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, thank you for the question. So um, the additional residential unit provisions, uh, the consultation started with our additional residential unit discussion paper. So it would have started in, I believe the meeting was on June 23rd. The discussion paper would have been released, uh, you know, the week prior to that. So we're looking at, uh, you know, at least 10 months of consultation. Um, from a, from a legal perspective, and I, I would invite my colleague, Ms. Morley, to, to jump in on, on this particular response because um, additional residential units are an obligation that, we, that we're required to meet in the new zoning bylaw in accordance with the Planning Act. So when we, when we are looking at the tests that have been established uh, by the province when we're implementing the new citywide zoning bylaw, um, we are required to have official plan policies that implement the additional residential unit provisions of the Planning Act and have zoning bylaw provisions that allow for, for those additional residential units. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Morley. Thank you, through your worship. Just to echo what Ms. Flaherty said, pursuant to the Planning Act, it is an obligation of the municipality to include policies in its official plan that authorize two additional residential units in a detached house, semi-detached house, or row house plus one additional residential unit in a building or structure that's ancillary to that house. So it is not discretionary for the municipality to permit additional residential units. We are required to do so under the Planning Act. Uh, Councilor McLean, you just have to put your mic on. Sorry, if we were to delay it, what kind of penalties would we be suffering? Ms. Morley? Through you, Your Worship, it would certainly be open to anyone to appeal the municipality's failure to include required provisions. Um, official plan amendments are also approved by the minister, so the minister has the ability to refuse the official plan if it doesn't contain the policies that it's required to contain. So essentially, we would be in some sort of serious trouble with regards to all everything else in the city that has to do with planning, is that correct? Through your worship, serious trouble would be an accurate representation, yes. <laughs> serious trouble. That's a quote from staff, Councillor McLaren. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Just a few comments from me and a uh, follow-up question from the, the briefing. So the first is on the resolve clause that we removed right crescent. I just want to say that I think that was a courageous move by staff. Uh, from my perspective, there was a number of opportunities for public consultation, but the fact that uh, staff are looking to build community and not just push through policy, I think, is really something that's commendable. So I want to recognize that and encourage the public. This is your opportunity, again, to come out and have your voice heard. So, uh, yeah, not to scold or be paternalistic there, but I think it's uh, worth mentioning that there it is. There's the opportunity for consultation. Um, follow up on my questions about the provisions for the holding symbol. That was in the supplemental report. And I now have come to understand that it was under the central growth strategy. So perhaps Ms. Eggerwall could clarify why we're only having servicing and transportation uh, recognized for the H symbol. Ms. Eggerwall. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So, um, so that's correct, Councillor Kylie. Ky those two holding conditions are included within the CKGS intensification areas only, um, and those were um, identified through the technical review of the CKGS work by um, Utilities Kingston and Transportation Services. And um, more detailed conditions are included within the actual uh, body of the zoning bylaw. I believe it's Section 22, which includes. Um, uh, those conditions in more detail as to um, what exactly is included within a servicing study and what needs to be specifically included within the transportation study. Um, so, however, I would like to note that 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 is those are not the only two studies that we could require after the holding um, application 
uh, lift has been approved by council. Staff still have the ability to require additional studies through the site plan control process if needed. However, like I mentioned at the time of the CKGS study, through the review of, of the CKGS work, in, which included a servicing uh, component and a transportation uh, component, those were the two conditions that were identified. Thank you, and if I could follow up on that through you to Ms. Agarwal. Can you also confirm that planning committee has the opportunity to ask for additional studies in regard to an H symbol? So you mentioned that staff can do that through site plan, but that's also still within the purview of the, the democratic body, is that correct? So um, the way the holding conditions have been drafted for the intensification areas, there are only two conditions included. So one is the servicing study and one is the um, the transportation um, study. So at this time, we cannot include other studies within the holding condition unless, I mean, unless council wishes to amend that today. Right, okay, so that would be something on, on the elected officials to, to do, correct? Sorry, just wanna be very clear about that. Yes, correct. And, and I just wanted to also mention that um, section 22 of the new zoning bylaw includes um, a list of other holding conditions that may apply to other um, properties that are subject to the holding overlay. And there are a variety of other holding conditions as well that, that may be applicable depending on um, this, the location of the property or um, the type of um, technical review that may be needed to be completed. Okay, thank you. And then a final comment uh, before I happily vote in favor for this is that I don't think we should be afraid of potential density. And I think the word potential is key here, that the new zoning doesn't demand that what's built in that location reach those potentials, but it allows for it in the best interest of the city in terms, as Ms. Agnew, I think, said really remarkably, transit, livability, servicing, and so forth. So when we hear that for example, at Wright Crescent, we could have up to 12 stories. That doesn't mean that that will happen. And I think that when we remember that's the framework that we're operating in, just the potential, and that can hopefully put some folks at ease. So I would say this is very well done, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councilor Chappelle. Thank you, Theory, your, your, uh, your honor. Um, <laughs> Worship, rather. I'm thinking of my wife. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm still a bit perplexed, and I'm, I'm just reflecting back on a, a, the good conversation I had with Ms. Agnew. And I'm looking at the map on Dash right now of the area that, in particular. And and it, it, it strikes me that uh, this entire community is, is really striking a balance of around 25 units per hectare. And the greatest density where I express the greatest concern with current parking problems that I raise at almost every planning meeting is an area that has 100% townhomes. And I understand that's in the phasing process how we achieve that. But that in itself is only achieving 35 units per hectare at that area. So if I'm looking at the far reach, like like many, many, almost a kilometer and a half away from, maybe even two kilometers away from Princess Street and the main corridor for transit, we're looking at having a higher density area to achieve this new requirement that is being proposed in this, this, this proposal. And it's not just a framework, it's gonna be required going forward. Are you? Are we expecting condos to be developed up there that, that's so far away from Princess Street and Transit? Because I'm not sure that at this section, it's not in a, it's not on a main corridor. That that is the best location to have substantively increased density. And so my question is: Is that the intent of the planning committee, uh, the planning department, is to have high density up at that north end of that development that it's almost completely phased out now? Ms. Clarity. Uh, through you, uh, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor Chappelle, for your questions. I think uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, the response to this and certainly invite my colleagues to jump in who have been involved in this conversation as well. So the, the lands that are proposed to be pre-zoned are, are currently not developed and we haven't received any draft plans or, or information about the future development of these lands. They're 
are two different areas within these future subdivision lands that are uh, designated differently within the secondary plan. So there's a low density residential designation and there's a medium density residential de designation. So within the, it, it kind of looks like a backwards P that we're, that we're actually talking about within Woodhaven. So um, within those areas, there are, are three smaller areas that are within the medium density residential designation. And then there are two areas that are within the low density. So in the medium density, the secondary plan calls for a density range of 25 to 75 units per net hectare. Within the low density range, the secondary plan calls for 14 to 45 units per net hectare. Um, there's also a general provision in the official plan that requires a minimum density of 37 and a half in the greenfield subdivision areas. So when we looked at those provisions, we implemented uh, minimum densities that are within the ranges. So in the low density, the range is 14 to 45. With a general OP policy at 37 and a half, we established the minimum at 37 and a half in that area. In the medium density area where the range is 25 to 75, we went right for the middle at, at 50. So the location of those densities that we've established on this map aligns with the vision that's established already by that secondary plan. So when we're talking about location of potential condos or, or you know, uh, mid-rise apartment buildings at like a, a lower scale or walk-up apartment buildings or triplexes or duplexes or townhouse townhouse units or stack townhouses or back-to-back -to -back townhouses the 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 range of housing opportunities that we've provided within these pre-zoned subdivision lands doesn't require the developer to provide a tall condo building in a location to to meet the density there are certainly a wide range of housing types and typologies that align with the areas that are contemplated for development within within the secondary plan. So I, I really wanted to ensure that, you know, we haven't just taken these numbers out of the blue. They very much are directly connected to those OP density ranges. And they they very much do align with that low density designation and medium density designation for those residential lands in that sub in that secondary plan. So just as a just a clarification, are you aware of the highest density within the Woodhaven area currently in existence, perhaps on Horizon Drive or Jeanette, what it what the actual density is? Uh, either Mr. Barr or Ms. Flaherty. Apologies, I was just having a hard time of meeting myself and then I turned my camera off. So uh, thank you and through your worship. We've looked at the, the densities across that area. Um, certain phases have definitely built out at, at higher or lower densities all within the larger phase of itself. But the average for the area is coming in at 25 to 26 units per net hectare uh, through that subdivision uh, process. Some of the more dense areas, areas comprised predominantly of towns, uh, have a higher density than those comprised predominantly of the single detached dwellings. Uh, but on mass for the Woodhaven area, we're about 25 to 26 units per net hectare with the development that's currently uh, built and currently proposed through formal applications. So to answer the question, where the townhouses are, what is the achieving, what is the density they're achieving, where all those townhouses are, where I get all the complaints about my units. Thank you, and through your worship. The, the latest application we've had come in uh, that I'm aware of is Woodhaven 5, which is predominantly proposed as all town. That came in around 33 units per net hectare. Um, and that is the most recent example of, of a fully townhouse subdivision and the density that it's achieving by just being townhouses. So, I guess, Mr. Barr, what I'm trying to understand is what build form has to exist at that far end of that subdivision in order to achieve that greater density that this proposal is looking at having. Thank you, through Your Worship. The, the regulations that have come forward by the, through staff for the new zoning bylaw include a variety of housing types. So 
predominantly all we've seen in Cat West so far are single semis in town. Uh, for the new area north of the existing development, uh, that is currently undeveloped, unzoned, but designated for medium density. We've included alternative housing forms for, for townhouses, for low-rise apartment buildings, you know, triplexes, quadplexes, um, small apartment buildings um, that can actually achieve those densities through those areas. So through the, the regulations of the official plan, which actually support these types of housing units in this area, the zoning is now catching up and matching uh, those proposed uses and actually permitting them as of right uh, moving forward. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think I've badgered this one enough. I appreciate uh, as as my fellow councillors have commented on, there's certainly been a lot of work that went into this over the last seven years and it, it's nice to see that it's coming together. I mean, amalgamation took place over 21 years ago and to finally have this coming forward, I think is a, is a great stride for the city of Kingston. Uh, thank you, Councillor Chappelle. I would echo your comments. This is a, a big step for the city. Are there any other comments? Any further discussion? Councillor Hutchison. Excuse me, I strangle myself in my mask. I just wanted to to um, second the uh, comments from various councillors about all the hard work that was put into this. Notice that it said it started in 2011, and I think Councillor Sanic and I can attest to that. It started long before that. It was started before we even were elected in 2006. So congratulations, and um, the, some of the answers were really good. Um, from um, the various staff members. So I appreciate that. And hopefully we're moving forward in a constructive way. As they said, uh, if we didn't make priorities, they'd, they could have done whatever the heck they wanted. So um, the relative to the provincial policy. So, um, but they didn't and they went further. And I think we have to congratulate them on that. And because it's all about what kind of city you wanna live in and with climate change, it's all about the type of city you can live in. So um, I think they're trying their best to move us along in that direction, and I thank them for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will call the vote on Clause 1. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Chappelle? Do you have a point of order? Well, uh, just... I do have an amendment to put forward for at least discussion, and so, uh, we'll see. So, Councillor Chappelle, you've already you've already spoken. So oh, already I thought spoken. that was second round. So, oh. in council meetings, we don't do that. So, if there's no further anyone that wants to speak that has not already spoken, if not, we will call the vote on clause one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of eight to one. Councillor Chappelle opposed. Okay, uh, with that, that uh, with the passing of clause one, report number 42, uh, the recommendation from planning committee is, is moot. Uh, and so with that, uh, we will go down. Obviously we've noted the number of communications. Uh, is there any other business? Okay, Madam Deputy Clerk, I'll ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Neal, that bylaws one through five and 11 be given their first and second reading. And I just wanted to point out uh, that uh, bylaws six through 10, uh, <coughs> excuse me, have been withdrawn uh, with the withdrawal of the recommendation from the Planning Committee. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Neal, that bylaws one through five and 11 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, with that, and again, uh, on behalf of all of council, our thanks to uh, the great work by our staff, uh, an enormous amount of work 
over the last months, over the last years. Congratulations and thank you to everyone involved. With that, I will call a motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Hutchison. All those in favour? Opposed? And we're adjourned. Thanks very much.